Good evening. My name is Brian Roberts. I'm the director of the Mexican Center, the Teresa Lozano Long Center for Latin American Studies. I'd like to welcome you all here tonight for this event, uh, the first in our Foodways of Mexico series. There will be two further ones in our academic year. The next one after Claudia is going to be Rachel Loudon, a British food historian who has lived in Guanajuato, and then she will be followed by Diana Kennedy, uh, the noted cookbook author. And I'm told that the series stretches into eternity, so, that, <laughs> so stay with it and we'll cover the foods of Mexico. But I'd particularly, obviously, like to welcome Claudia. Claudia Alacon um, has been in, lived in Austin since about 1984, and um, she did uh, uh, a degree in anthropology with a minor in Latin American studies. Her honors thesis on the history, culture, significance, ritual of the tamal uh, in, in Mexico was to win a prize, and then became published in what sounds to me like a very prestigious journal because it's in French. It's called the <laughs> Petit Propos Culinaire. That's right. It was your article was in French too, or the... It's not in French, and that's an Oxford University publication. Ah, they're being pretentious. <laughs> <laughs> but she's, and Claudia's now working on, in trying to you know, transform this, this, this thesis, this honors thesis, into a full length, into a full length book. Uh, she's presented, um, She's presented at many conferences, International Association of Culinary Professionals, Foodways of Austin, Mexicarte Museum, and she's been writing professionally since 2000 to a variety of local, national publications. So, really, we are delighted to have you here, Claudia. Shows that our undergraduate education does some good. <laughs> so it's, uh, Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much, Brian. I really appreciate it. I appreciate all of you coming today. We're really excited about this series. Um, real quick, I just want to acknowledge a few people. Uh, first and foremost, uh, <laughs> come on out here. Gail Sanders, the uh, director of the uh, Mexico Center at LILAS. Of course, uh, Joe and Teresa Lozano Long, uh, who sponsor everything we are doing here. And uh, very especially, the person uh, thanks to whom we all are here today, uh, my mentor, Dr. Brian Strauss, who put me in the path of tamales about 10 years ago, and <laughs> I haven't strayed, Brian. <laughs> I'm still on it. Uh, a couple uh, more acknowledgments uh, on this presentation go to a couple of friends of mine, Veronica Vasquez, archaeologist from the Proyecto de Calakmul, and uh, Harry Ketunen from the University of Helsinki who helped me immensely with my uh, hieroglyphic and uh, my art history. As I was saying earlier, my research started at uh, UT while doing my undergraduate uh, in anthropology. Brian uh, suggested that I may want to research tamales since I liked food and liked writing. And uh, I, I, I started, graduated, and the thesis was published. Uh, like the other Brian mentioned. At that point, I received a letter from Alan Davidson, who was a fabulous uh, food historian and the director and publisher of Oxford University Press. Letter to congratulate me and annexing a little critique sent by one Diana Kennedy. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, she read my stuff. <laughs> And uh, at that point, I figured, well, maybe I'm onto something and I'm going to pursue it. So I've been pursuing it for about 10 years now. Uh, as a volunteer at the Maya meetings, I met a lot of Maya experts and epigraphers. Um, as a food writer, I've, I've learned a lot about journalism and, and writing and uh, through a few grants that I obtained uh, finagling here and there. I've traveled a lot around Mexico. I've gotten to learn a little bit more about the Malis, and of course, the more I look, the more I find. Therefore, that's why I'm still working on this book that seems like it's never going to be published. But I am hopeful that I'm working with a editor at University of Texas Press, and perhaps the spring of 2011, we'll see a book on this research. 
So today I'm just going to talk briefly, that's why it's called a brief history. Um, after 10 years of research, I have tons of material, and I'm also not going to talk today about much cooking um, recipes or varieties of tamales. Um, I sometimes do classes at Central Market or Whole Foods, so keep an eye on that. Um, you might find me there and you might get some recipes. But today it's mostly going to be... So if you ask any Mexican, they will tell you pretty much there is no special occasion celebrated in our country without tamales. Tamales are common in weddings, baptisms, first communions, birthdays, you name it, including Day of the Dead, of course, the dead like tamales too. At uh, first glance, especially to us in Texas, they may seem like a humble food, a common food, and they are indeed, but uh, they also are one of Mesoamerica's oldest foodstuffs, and their roots reach deep into the past, possess a complex connection to Mesoamerican mythology, rituals, and festivities. This is what we're going to explore a little bit today. And we're going to start with a quick definition of the mat. And of course, uh, forgive me, Anglo speakers, because I use the Mexican term tamal rather than the anglicized term tamale. Uh, we can consider that tamales are maize breads, quote unquote. Uh, they may be filled with a variety of foods, but sometimes left unfilled. They're mostly cooked by steaming or baking. And a prerequisite for the definition of tamal is the presence of a plant leaf wrapping. Although in many modern societies, unfortunately, uh, aluminum foil has taken precedence over the vegetal wrappers. Uh, the first tamales were probably unfilled, just balls of masa wrapped in leaves and baked and eaten as a kind of bread that may have been dipped in sauces or boiled beans or stews. At one point, it must have become apparent that these fillings could be enveloped in the masa before cooking the tamal and then the tamal became the all-inclusive food item that we know today. It, you could consider it Mesoamerica's first convenience food. Uh, very nutritious, all-in-one meal that uh, can be carried, easy to eat right out of the hand without the necessity of vessels or utensils. Travel, um, travels well, it's ideal for perhaps Mesoamerican men and women who worked away on their fields or traveled for commerce to faraway markets. Tamales more, most commonly are uh, made with masa de nixtamal. Nixtamal is a uh, dry maize kernels cooked in water with calcium oxide, also known as slaked lime. And slaked lime is a term I learned from Diana Kennedy, who chastised me for calling it burnt lime in a very sweet way. She's a fabulous mentor. Tamales can also be made of uh, fresh corn, so it's not a requisite that they're made of nixtamal. The exact origin of nixtamal process is still unclear. It is possible that it was developed by the first Mesoamerican civilizations, however, since there is certain evidence of its preparation in Salinas La Blanca, which is an early Olmec site at the border between Chiapas and Guatemala at approximately 1200 to 900 BC. This process releases nutrients from the maize kernel and renders it digestible by removing its outer skin. The consumption of calcium oxide also helps unlock proteins from the beans that are traditionally eaten with maize products. Therefore, nixtamalization may well be the catalyst for the exceptional development of a highly sophisticated civilization in Mesoamerica. Without it, these groups would have had to rely on other foods as source of nourishment, and the importance of maize in their culture would have diminished. There are hundreds of varieties of tamales, so therefore I'm not going to speak about them today. There seem to be as many as there are cooks that cook them. Some are made for common everyday use, and some have strict ritual contexts, as well as cultural differences in the process of being made. The diversity in ingredients is significant from geographical and environmental points, uh, as well as from symbolic purposes of the tamal. They exist practically all over Latin America, but Mexico has by far the largest diversity and incredible regional variations. So for instance, 
tamales in the north of Mexico are very, very distinct and different from tamales in the Yucatan Peninsula. If you ever find yourself in Mexico City in February, an excellent opportunity to sample many of these tamales is the annual Feria del Tamal events. Dozens of vendors set up booths and sell homemade tamales typical of their state or country. Countries include Nicaragua, Colombia, Guatemala, Honduras, Cuba, Chile, and uh, many others. And hundreds of people, as you can see, stop by during this week-long festivals to sample all kinds of tamales traditionally served with atole, which is a hot beverage made out of also corn masa. It is important now to know that tamales have been in use since pre-Columbian times and have evolved to include new ingredients, changing costumes and technology. Of course, after the Spanish conquest, a radical change occurred in the Mesoamerican diet with new foodstuffs blended in with local ingredients, thus giving birth to a new mestizo cuisine, hand in hand with the new country of Mexico. Tamales also evolved at this point to incorporate dozens of new ingredients, such as the ones we know now, pork, beef, chicken, and some esoteric ingredients that are widely used in Mexico, like olives, capers, and raisins. Of course, one of the most dramatic changes was the addition of lard and meat broth to the masa, which makes the masa richer and softer and changes the nutritional value of the former simpler tamales. We're going to delve a little bit into the esoteric world of Mesoamerican mythology. In pre-Columbian Mesoamerica, the cycles of life and death were tied to agricultural cycles, and specifically the planting and harvesting of corn, around which many myths evolved. According to both Maya, Aztec, and in general, Mesoamerican cultural myths, maize is synonymous with life itself. It is the only substance capable of bringing human beings into life. When the creator gods attempted to make humans out of clay and wood, they failed miserably, and the resulting creatures had no soul, therefore they became monkeys and wild animals of the forest. The Maya myths of creation are recorded, or at least some of them, in the Popol Vuh, which is the Quiche book of creation. I'm not even going to start to try to tell you the entire story. But in a very small nutshell, uh, first father and first mother shaped the true people out of yellow and white corn, which they brought out from Sustenance Mountain. Their hope was to create beings that could reciprocate their love and care by returning nourishment to their creators. By making beings out of maize, they succeeded beyond their expectations because their creations were capable of prayer and worship, providing sustenance to their gods by suckling them through bloodletting and sacrifice. These myths represent a very interesting relationship between maize and people, because maize becomes the bond between people and the gods, and the vehicle through which life is passed on and regenerated. The gods provide water in the form of rain, which helps engender maize from the earth. The maize becomes human sustenance provided by the gods so people will survive and then sacrifice to them through the offerings of blood, which is the substance of human life. So there is a cycle of transformation that changes food, maize, into the flesh of gods and humans, and then back into food for the gods, blood. This cycle explains the central role of maize in food offerings, meals, and ceremonial banquets in Mesoamerican religious life. So given this context, tamales may be seen as a symbolic representation of human flesh. And by offering tamales to the gods, people are offering a symbolic human sacrifice, offering maize and water instead of flesh and blood. The birth and death cycle of the maize god is also told through another Maya myth of the Popol Vuh, the one of Hun Hunafpu, or the young maize god, also known in the glyphic Maya corpus as Hun al Ye, which means one maize kernel, in one of interpretations. Again, this is a super condensed version, and I really encourage you, if you're interested, to read the Popol Vuh and to pursue a little more knowledge of the wonderful Maya myths. And at this point, I must give a disclaimer to please take into account that these people induce visions through self-bloodletting, 
into various parts of their body with stingray spines that were rubbed on the backs of hallucinogenic toads. So in this myth, uh, Maze God, Hun Hunafpu, is the son of first father and first mother. An accomplished ball player than he is, he gets invited to play by the lords of Shibalba, which is the Maya underworld. Of course, they're, they're the bad guys, and they trick him, so he loses the game. He's promptly decapitated, and his head buried. And from this place where the head was buried, springs forth a tree. And the fruit of the tree is human heads. And one happy day, uh, this lovely maiden named Shkik is the daughter of a uh, lord of the underworld. She walks by one day, and one of these heads spits on her hand as she tries to pick the fruit and thus gets impregnated. So when her pregnancy is noticed, the father orders her killed. She manages to escape, luckily, and goes to the world of humans, where she gives birth to the hero twins. The Hir twins, being the, the sons of the maize god, uh, descend into Shibalba to defeat the lords in the ritual ball game and avenge their father. So they do defeat the lords, resurrect uh, the maize god, who emerges back into the world in the shape of a maize plant. So this closes the cycle of death and resurrection of maize and humans. And in this classic Maya plate, which is one of my all-time amazing favorite works of art, uh, you see the rebirth scene of the maize god where the turtle uh, shell is representing the earth and the maize god is springing forth from the middle. The hero twins are on the sides tending to him and you can see one of them is holding a you know, water pot or perhaps something stronger to nourish him uh, back to life. Again, the iconography is just amazing and I can't even begin to tell you so I fully encourage you to read more. So this being a recurring theme in Maya art, these stories reveal the significance of maize as the center of this culture. Maize being the axis mundi of Maya cosmology, the tree of life, and its most precious substance. There are numerous representations of the rebirth of the maize god as the one we have seen in Maya art. And this is another, this is a tablet of the foliated cross at Palenque, and you can see another representation of the maize god springing forth from the earth, which is here represented as, again, the sustenance mountain, uh, also known as the mountain monster, uh, emerging in the shape of a corn plant. And you can see uh, wonderful heads springing forth as ears of corn, and their long strands of hair are like the silk of the corn. This detail here, you can see the anthropomorphic ears of corn, uh, springing forth the branches, representing the maize god. And interestingly enough, uh, Mexican historian Enrique Florescano has compared Hun Hunapu, the Maya maize god, to Quetzalcoatl, who is an Aztec deity that also had the capacity to regenerate himself after being killed and dismembered, like the maize god in the ball court. In the Aztec myth, Quetzalcoatl is also the deity that creates humans and gives them sustenance through maize. Now here is where it gets really interesting. It's the summer of 2001 in San Bartolo in the rainforest of the Petén region in the lowlands of Guatemala. And archaeologist William Saturno spots what looked like a mural while seeking shade in a looter's trench dug into an unexplored temple. Curious about this finding, he returns and starts excavating the site with his team in March of 2003. And what they find, according to project iconographer Dr. Carl Tauba of the University of California at Riverside, is equivalent to the Sistine Chapel of the early Maya culture. Incredibly impressive imagery that depicts a kneeling woman holding forth an offering and presenting it to the maize god, which is the figure in red. She emerges from a cave in the sacred Sustenon mountain. This is where the gods found the corn that they brought out to give to humans. So the, does that sound familiar? This part of the Maya creation myth, uh, well, pretty much experts believe that the creation myth first appeared during the classic period of the Maya culture around 250 AD. But what's really cool is that this mural was painted at about 100 AD. Here's the coolest part, really, and this is the one that almost made me cry when I saw it the first time. The offering that's being presented to the maize god is sustenance emerging in the shape of tamales. 
So it is now completely clear with evidence that tamales have been at the center of Mesoamerican culture and civilization long before anybody thought previously. The classic Maya also developed the most complex written language in ancient Mesoamerica. Uh, Carl Taube, who is also an epigrapher, proposed in 1989 that Maya epigraphy supplies evidence that tamales constituted the principal maize food of the classic Maya. Now, 1989 was before we just saw that wonderful mural that presented it previously. Regardless, uh, independently and simultaneously, Dr. Taube and Dr. Bruce Love identified the Maya glyph T130, seen in figure one, which represents a tamal with a leaf wrapper and whose phonetic reading is wah a Maya word signifying food or sustenance. According to some of my Yucatec informants, when I did my research travels, the physical proof that one is of pure Maya blood is a dark spot on the lower back, which is known as the Wa. So the word Wa, as I just mentioned in its Marian variations, uh, according to different Maya languages, means sustenance, tortilla, or tamal. So thus, today, the Maya are still considered to be made of maize and the living tamales. So in this figure, we see uh, figure one is a post-classic and a late classic form of the glyph wa. Figure two is affix T86, named by Carl Taube as a foliated corn curl. Figure three is affix T135, known as a notch ball tamales. Figure four and five are the glyph for the day sign con in the Maya calendar. And the drawings below are the separated elements. So you see the whole glyph. And then in the bottom, you see the little ball being the tamal and the little squirrely thing being the wrapper. It's important to note uh, also that in both Maya art and epigraphy, tamales are usually depicted outside or without a wrapper, probably to identify them easily. Here's another important recent discovery a series of murals on the facade of a buried building near the great plaza of Calakmul in the Mexican state of Campeche. The iconographic program of these murals has no parallel in the Maya region since it is not related to ritual ceremonies or warfare. It corresponds instead to activities of daily life, including the preparation and consumption of food. Most experts today, including Archaeologist Veronica Vasquez, who is a researcher in the project, and kindly let me use these photographs, believe that it could be depicting a festivity related to sociopolitical aspects, such as a feast. But others, like Simon Martin, a Maya epigrapher and expert, think it is the representation of a market. Simon Martin identifies dispensers and recipients in these mural scenes and proposes that the captions above are directly associated with specializations of said dispensers in a market activity. And here we can see a close-up of these glyphs, and the caption reads, ah, wah, and I'm not going to bore you with the Maya glyph grammar, but in a nutshell it means it's read as the tamal person, being the specialization of the dispensers. The centers of this theory argue that we can observe people offering food and people eating it, but there's no explicit activity relating to exchange, so therefore it wouldn't be a market. However, because pretty much every image I've ever seen studying Maya art and epigraphy has to do with death, war, and rulers, I really hope Simon is right, and it really is a market. I know he's brilliant, and he is probably going to be able to prove it somehow. In classic Maya vessels, tamales are most commonly depicted in the context of offerings to gods and rulers. Tamales are depicted either round and covered with a sauce like these. Some look rolled, perhaps representing tamales that are layered with beans and then rolled. Most are oval objects, white or yellow, representing the uh, most widely known maize types. This is a palace scene common in classic Maya pottery representing a lord with an offering of tamales on a tripod plate and a drinking cup with a foaming beverages, beverage, which perhaps could be cacao, the sacred beverage of Mesoamericans, which is really cool and interesting because today tamales are traditionally still accompanied by a cup of hot chocolate. Tamales appear in various forms on Maya ceramic vessels. And here we can see a few examples from Carl Taube's paper. 
figure A depicts tamales uh, with a spiral curl. And as I said before, perhaps they are depicting tamales mixed with beans and then rolled up. Figure B are filled tamales, so those have a certain filling. <laughs> figure C, again, are tamales on a tripod vessel accompanied by a drinking vessel, perhaps cacao, atole, or pulque. Figures D and E are tamales with sauce on top. You can see those little dots, and those usually represent a sauce. In the Dresden Codex, which is a post-classic Maya hand-drawn book, tamales are shown also in different varieties. Figure A shows a plain tamal. Figure B shows it topped by that corn curl that I showed you earlier, the ah glyph, wah glyph. Figure C is topped with a jash glyph, which means green. So it's speculated that these tamales may have been made out of fresh corn rather than mixed tamalized corn and wrapped in fresh corn leaves rather than dried corn husks. Figures D through F show tamales that could have been filled with whatever is on top of them. So D shows a fish, E shows some kind of bird, and F shows an iguana. And for the record, I have tried all of these tamale fillings at one point or another. Actually, tamales, iguana tamales can still be found, although they are becoming rare, in uh, coastal regions of the state of Oaxaca. This giant tamal here, uh, depicted in a classic Maya vessel from Tayasal in Guatemala, could indeed be a bridge to the present. In contemporary Yucatec agricultural ceremonies, large round tamales known as Navawa are commonly offered to the chacks of the four cardinal directions. The chacks are the Maya deities responsible for bringing rain. These tamales are formed by successive layers of masa, then meat and sauce, wrapped in avocado leaves and cooked underground in a pit known as pib. They also may be found covered with sikil, which is a paste made from ground pumpkin seeds. And here is the reason why I believe they are a bridge to the present. A contemporary example of a large maya tamal from the Yucatan city of Mani in central state of Yucatan. These are called mukbil pollo and they are prepared throughout the Yucatan area, generally offered during Hanal Pishan, which is the Feast of the Souls, or a Maya Yucatec version of the Day of the Dead. In fact, there's a really neat anecdote to this one. Um, these, of course, were taken by me. I was able to go and see these made with a Maya family for the anniversary of the death of the patriarch of the family. I was very lucky to participate in the whole process. And then I read Incidents of Travel in the Yucatan by John Lloyd Stevens, who was an American lawyer and explorer who discovered many uh, ruins of the ancient Maya sites. And he wrote in 1843 about Mugbil Poyos. And I just have to read this to you because I just love his 19th century speech. But pretty much he said that some well-meaning neighbors sent him a huge piece of mukbi pollo that was as hard as an oak plank and as thick as six of them. In a fit of desperation, we took it out into the courtyard and buried it. There it would have remained till this day, but for a malicious dog that accompanied them on their next visit. He passed into the courtyard, rooted it up, and while we were pointing at the empty platters as our acknowledgement of their kindness, this villainous dog sneaked through the sala and out of the front door with a pie in its mouth, apparently grown bigger since it was buried. <laughs> They're not that bad, really. Today, these tamales are filled with chicken and sometimes chicken and pork. Although, if they were prepared in pre-Columbian times, turkey would have likely been the stuffing. The sauce is called Kol. Kol is considered the blood of the tamal. It is also rubbed on the outside to give it a nice red color and to seal the filling in. And the red color looks just like in that painting of the, on the vessel we saw previously. Like the Navawa that I mentioned earlier, these tamales are also baked in a piv over coals and hot rocks and buried for about an hour. Another colleague of mine, anthropologist Judith Strupp-Green, who has documented Hanal Pishan celebrations in some Maya communities, 
proposes that cooking this tamal underground represents a ritual burial and resurrections, just like that of the maize god. I also think it could represent the planting of seed corn and its resurgence as nourishment for humans. Of the Spanish chroniclers, perhaps Fray Bernardino de Sagún dedicated the most time to detailing the foods of the Aztec in his compilation of writings known as the Florentine Codex. He described many varieties of tamales that were available at the time of the conquest and their production, consumption, and ritual uses. According to his writing, the Aztec consumed tamales at weddings, births, and on many occasions for celebration, including celebration of deities, but they also were widely available as a common foodstuff found at markets. Sagun observes that on the 10th month of the Aztec calendar, known as Xocotluetzi, they celebrated the festivities dedicated to the dead with huge tamales made of amaranth. The festivities dedicated to the god of the underworld, Miscoatl, took place during their 14th month, called Quechcoli, when a couple of sweet tamales were placed on top of grapes. In many regions of Mexico, tamales are still offered during the Day of the Dead, and many particularly interesting varieties are prepared specifically for these festivities. This one seen here, uh, I don't know, friend in Oaxaca is known as Tamal de Siete Cueros, seven skin tamal, made in layers, as you can see, with beans rolled and then sliced, not unlike a jelly roll. And it's impossible not to note that the rolling creates that spiral pattern that resembles the one seen in the pre-Hispanic depictions of tamales we saw previously. Sagun also notes 10 specific Aztec calendar celebrations in which tamales were offered, many in relation to agricultural events. This includes February 2nd, which corresponds with the beginning of the first month of the Aztec calendar. And here Sagun writes, this month began the second day of February when we celebrate the purification of Our Lady. On the first day of this month, they celebrated, according to some, the Tlaloque gods, who they believe are the gods of rain. Sound familiar? The Catholic celebration on February 2nd is known in Mexico as Dia de la Candelaria. As Sagún explains, it parallels ancient Mexican planting ceremonies and represents the start of the agricultural cycle. For many indigenous groups, it represents a day of blessing and purification of seeds that will be sowed and cultivated the following season. Others celebrated as a purification of the Virgin Mary, as Sagun explained, and the presentation of Jesus in the Temple of Jerusalem. In Mexico, this is represented by porcelain figurines of the baby Jesus, who get elaborately dressed to be presented and blessed at the church on that day. This example I love, and this I found at the Museo de las Culturas Populares in Mexico City on an exhibit of a competition of dressed baby Jesus figurines. As you can see, he's dressed like an Aztec noble. I don't know if you can see his embroidered little dress. Looks like he is sprouting forth from a watery environment and sprouting all kinds of plants and ears of corn and corn plants. And in the background is a mountain that looks like it's erupting. That is probably Popocatépetl. <laughs> He's perched atop a little temple made of all kinds of grains, beans, rice, and wheat, if I remember correctly. Copal, well, incense, uh, burner up in the front, a little rabbit representing spring and prosperity of life, I suppose. This is an incredibly perfect example of the syncretic relationship between the Catholic and Aztec nature that permeate this holiday. Of course, it also, to me, represents its incredible and inextricable relation to the planting cycle of the ancient Mesoamericans. As fate would have it, Dia de la Candelaria is notably the holiday for consumption of tamales in Mexico. So, to me, it suggests another ritual association. Tamales in this occasion may be representing the bundle baby Jesus as a parallel, so to speak, to the birth of the maize god. How cool is that? 
Sagún also describes many other types of tamales that were common in pre-conquest Mexico and are sold at the markets by people whose job was of a tamalera, a professional maker and seller of tamales. Tamaleras are often found in the streets and markets of cities, big and small, in modern-day Mexico, and actually also Guatemala and Belize. I'm pretty sure they exist in many other countries in Latin America that I have yet to visit in further research. Of course, in many of Mexico's urban centers, such as Mexico City, Dia de la Candelaria spurs an incredible economic opportunity for small family-owned tamales businesses. And these here are an example of Aztec times from the Codex Mendoza. And I kind of like the progression because that Huastec lady in Ciudad Valles has a headdress and a basket that looks just like it. And then that other lady in Oaxaca City is a little more modern, but their face to me looks the same. It's just really an incredible bridge to me that is clear and evident of a tradition that has not changed for centuries. I know you're anxious to ask a thousand questions that I probably can't answer. Most likely you're anxious to go try some tamales for yourself. <laughs> so I'm just going to tell you a quick note to end the first part of this presentation. Tamales are clearly beloved by young and old, rich and poor, rural and urban folks, in Mexico specifically, but all over Latin America. And they have been an intrinsic part of Mesoamerican culture, religion, and economy for centuries, as I believe I have demonstrated. Because of their constant representation as an offering and it, their association with depictions of the maize god of the complex mythology of Mesoamerica, I propose that tamales may have acted as a representation of the body of the maize god and may be interpreted as a symbolic human sacrifice. As such, they have been offered in rituals for deities, for the dead, and at feasts or special occasions since pre-Hispanic times. And clearly, these ritual uses carry through today. Tamales remain an important cultural link between the ancient and modern beliefs of the peoples of Mesoamerica. And with this, I want to thank you for coming to my little humble presentation. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. <laughs>